Ready. Welcome to the African American Initiatives Summit on Race and Politics. I am Alan Benson. We have just witnessed voting across the nation in national, state, and local elections. And it begs the question, how far was this exercise in democracy reflected? And was it a true expression of what it portends to be? In other words, to what extent was this a true exercise in democracy? We know this experience, experiment in our system of government is predicated on free elections. And we must question, are we truly represented, especially when we consider the issue of race? The African-American initiative is a wide array of primarily African-American stakeholders, leaders, and operatives that come together to address the issues that confront the African-American community. It features policy and issue-driven discussions to promote a greater understanding of what produces outcomes that we witness today. AAI recognizes that it is through these insights that we can better inspire and plan actions that are productive for the future. We are pleased to present a panel of knowledgeable and involved political participants to discuss the current circumstances and issues that affect voter outcomes, particularly when it comes to race. Once again, the African American Initiative is pleased to co-host this event with the AARP of Kentucky and the continuing collaboration with Cy Boule, a Sigma Pi Phi fraternity and WLOU Radio, who is simulcasting this event at 1350 AM and 104.7 FM on your dial as we live stream this event on Facebook Live and later to be posted on YouTube. AAI also wants to give special recognition to the National Black Caucus of State Legislators for their continuing work on the front lines of our nation's capitals, fighting for truth, justice, and equality. Now, our moderator for this event, Kentucky State Senator Gerald Neal. Thank you, Senator Neal. Thank you, Alan, and thank you everyone out there viewing. Uh, you know, once again, your voices were heard. We all know what voting is about. And we also know that it's important for us to vote. But the question is, is there a true exercise in democracy if there's not adequate representation? In other words, what is the true outcome in terms of representation? Well, we know historically what we've done is if you're a black candidate, you play to your base, everyone plays to their base. And race is a very powerful dynamic in terms of your base. And historically, that's what has been done. But now there's a new breed. And I must say, not just a new breed, because there have been precursors to this. There have been individuals that have had a, brace, a, a base that was not predicated upon having uh, their own uh, base that looks like them. But in this case, a base that's a majority base is not a base that looks like them. But there seems to be something different in the air, and there seems to be some lessons we all can learn. And that's why AAI has invited an array of individuals that have been involved in this, in this particular process that have a perspective where the base does not look like themselves, the majority base. So we're happy to have with us Robert Blake, who is the mayor of the city of Richmond, Richmond, Kentucky. We also have Ms. Paula McCraney, Councilwoman, Louisville Metro Council District 7, Louisville, Kentucky. We have Angela Evans, Bid County Attorney, that's Lexington. We additionally have Kimberly Bird, Bid County Commonwealth Attorney, Lexington, Kentucky. And we also have James Atkins, Mayor elect, City of Danville, Danville, Kentucky. I want to welcome them all with respect to this. But we're going to give them each a chance to speak and introduce themselves as well, starting with Mayor Blythe. Mayor Blythe, uh, it's very important to come off of your mute. Yes, sir. Mayor Blythe, we want to welcome you, but I'm going to ask you a very basic question. And I'm going to put this question in some form to each individual here today. Yes, yes. 
how did you get here and who are you? What do you do? Well, Senator, I appreciate the question because sometimes I have to sit and ask myself the same thing. First of all, please forgive me. I'm, I'm dealing with an allergy situation today, and, uh, uh, but, but we'll be fine. Um, from the time I was a youngster, I uh, aspired to do some things in leadership, but not so much as a politician, but as a public servant and an elected official. And uh, the first time I ran in 1977 uh, for city commissioner of the city of Richmond under our form of government, I lost by 11 votes. And I said uh, to the folks in the community, I will never run again, because when I checked the books to show who had voted, I saw 50 of my friends who didn't even go to vote that day because they assumed that I was going to win anyway. Well, 25 years later, I decided to run again back in 2002 and was successful. And uh, I have served now. Uh, eight terms as commissioner, that's 16 years, and just completed my first term as mayor. And thanks to the people of Richmond and the confidence that they've displayed, uh, I won again this time for a second term with a, a greater, much greater margin uh, than even the first time. I'd like to feel that I've done a good job. Now, I'm a native of Richmond. I'm a lifelong resident of Richmond. A retired school teacher, both at public school level and at the university. I'm pastor at the First Baptist Church here in Richmond. And I've, uh, as of next month, I've served that congregation for 41 years. Uh, go ahead and say it's time for me to go. But I've served there for 41 years and that's my home church, which is an honor. But uh, I've encountered over the many years, many of my students um, who have served in so many ways in our community, who've done well, and I appreciate that I had the opportunity to uh, teach them this quickly then. I want to thank I you. I want to thank you for that. We're going to get into some additional aspects of what, you're, you. doing, what you're doing now, so I want you to stay, stay steady with me. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We also have Paula McCraney, the Councilwoman, Global Metro Council District 7. Welcome, Councilwoman McCraney. And tell us, you're on mute as well, why, what, what is it? What do you do? How did you get there, briefly as you can? Well, I, I know a lot of inquiring minds want to know. In fact, when I first ran in 2018, just to raise funds to, to run for this seat was impossible because it seemed impossible for me to win it. It is a 92% white district, and it was uh, slightly more Republican than Democrat. And so while people believed in me and my capabilities, they didn't want to waste their money on a candidate that just didn't have an opportunity to win. Let but, me ask you a question, because we're going to get deep into that particular subject matter you're raising. What do you do? Exactly what do you do? Well, I serve on the Louisville Metro Council, and uh, it is a dis it's made up of 20, Louisville, Kentucky is made up of 26 separate districts. Each district has approximately 30,000 residents, and I serve 30,000 residents in District 7 of the Louisville Metro Council. Okay, so we also have, and thank you for that, Councilwoman McCraney. We also have with us Angela Evans, who's the Fed County Attorney. What does a Fed County Attorney do? You're talking about Lexington. What area does this cover? The entire county? Yes, Fayette County is Lexington. Lexington is Fayette County. So whew, in a nutshell, what do I do? The Fayette County Attorney's Office um, does adult and juvenile prosecution. Um, it, maintains authority over all misdemeanor adult prosecution. Um, we do the initial preliminary hearings for felonies for adults. We also um, prosecute child support and collect it. Uh, we also do property tax collection, delinquent property tax collection, as well as represent the county in uh, mental health courts. So adult guardianships when a loved one uh, 
may can no longer take care of themselves. We we uh, make sure that the person filing for guardianship is in fact uh, appropriate and won't take advantage of that individual. And um, let's see, that's generally it. But um, but it's a lot. It encompasses a whole lot. Um, so anyone, you know, the saying is anyone in Fayette County can find themselves interacting with the Fayette County Attorney's Office, whether they've um, <laughs> uh, gotten a criminal charge or their child is in trouble or there's you know a child support issue or again like I said they've had financial issues or um, need to take care of a loved one and which is also what attracted me to the office because it it is not just prosecution but also um, helping people get through difficult and uh, times so my bachelor's is in social work so it it really spoke to me all the way around so hopefully that's a quick uh, nutshell answer for you. Well, thank you very much and, and welcome to the program. We also have an awesome individual that's doing work as county commonwealth attorney. That's also in Lexington as well. Uh, that's distinguished between what you do and the county attorney does and what's your responsibility and welcome to AI's uh, summit. Thank you very much. Um, I am the Fayette Commonwealth attorney. And so when a person is arrested, this is probably 99% of the cases, when they are arrested, they're gonna start out in district court with Angela. <laughs> and then um, if they are going, if it's a felony, that's gonna stay a felony prosecuted um, a, a one year or more in terms of punishment that the county attorney is not gonna amend that they're gonna send up to us, then that would be us. So those cases are then sent by grand jury uh, to us. So that would be all the murders, rapes, robberies, um, those types of cases. And it will also be uh, juveniles who meet the criteria to be tried as an adult. Mainly those are the ones also charged with murder or armed robbery. Those very serious cases are the ones that our office handles. Um, I have been um, in my office for 26 years, born and raised in Lexington, has been in my office for 26 years. Um, and then I was recently appointed to this position on October the 1st. Um, so that's pretty much what I do. We have the, um, is this Angela, but we also have that awesome responsibility as prosecutors to make sure that the rights of the defendants are protected. So there's a lot of making sure that, you know, that things are being done above board, but we also have to handle the um, voice for victims. So we have to listen to them um, and make sure that they are being um their perspectives are being told in court um, and all being mindful of protecting the, the community um, and being safe. So we do have an awesome job. I didn't think I necessarily wanted to do this job when I started, but I've been here for 26 years and um, it's just something new every day and I love it. So the position you hold now is new, this appointment that puts you as what the head, head uh, Commonwealth attorney as opposed to the others that work in your office? Correct, I am the boss. I am, yeah. So, so I don't so, get to look back and, you know, pass it off to somebody else. I am the boss here. So you weren't the boss up until the time you were appointed? I was the, correct. I was the number two boss. So I was the first assistant <laughs> since 2016. Gotcha. Yes. And then All my right. boss. Outstanding. Mm -hmm. Outstanding. And we have a small, very special individual because I can call him Mayor, uh, Mayor Black, but I can call um, James Atkins Mayor Elect because he did something, uh, a first timer as well, uh, in his own space, uh, James Atkins, uh, city of Danville, Danville, Kentucky. Tell us what you do and tell us a little bit about how you got there. Well, I'm James J. H. Atkins. There yet. <laughs> Thank you, Senator Neal, for this opportunity. Um, I'm a lifetime educator, like Reverend Blythe. I've got over 40 years of experience in K, K through 16 education. But uh, I've always lived my life as a public servant. So I taught uh, eighth grade history and government and I always challenged my students to get involved and become public servants. So I'm a public servant. Uh, I've been uh, fortunate enough that the citizens of Denver have elected me to the uh, city council six times. This is my 12th year. I've served eight of those years as the mayor pro tem, the vice mayor and uh, this past November, uh, 
I, well, first of all, back in May, I won a primary involving three candidates. And then in uh, November, uh, I received 58% of the vote and was uh, elected as Danville's first African-American mayor. But I also want to stress the fact that the citizens know me as a, a servant and as a highly qualified, highly trained person in uh, this community. Uh, there's something I can say about all of you, having listened to this, is at least three things. One, that you obviously are African-American. Two, all three of you have a base, a constituency base, that does not, uh, that's not a majority African-American constituency base. And three, I hear a tremendous amount of preparation, that there's a lot that goes with you stepping forward to assume the type of responsibility that you had. It's not something you say, I just want to be that, and you just run out there and do it. Um, anyone, uh, step forward and speak to that. I'll start with Mayor Blythe for a second. Yes, one of the things that, um, and, and certainly uh, Mayor-elect Atkins and I share this, as, as he alluded to, but I had already been uh, involved in this community for many years in many ways, not only as a teacher, but also uh, serving on boards and committees and commissions, and uh, they were non-compensated. Uh, it's things that, right, right, Mayor, it's it, those things that are in your heart. And, uh, you know, Boys and Girls Club and uh, Red Cross and some of those things, but you do those things and, and you, you come to know people. People come to know you uh, as a servant. And, um, and I think that was one of the reasons that the folks were willing to elect me even a second time. Well, I'll put the same thing to uh, uh, Paul McCraney. Uh, Paul, if you don't mind, I I'm gonna call you Paul, just call me Gerald if you will. And we can get into a conversation here. But uh, in terms of your background and your preparation, uh, we got a little bit of that in your introduction, but go a little deeper into that. Let's understand that part of you in that district. Well, first of all, I am originally from Tulsa, Oklahoma, and I was recruited by PNC Bank to come to Louisville, Kentucky. I was in banking at the time that they discovered me and they reached out and recruited me and moved me to Louisville, Kentucky. Through PNC Bank, I was very active in the community because they were active in the community. And that was one of the things they required of their management staff. And so that started my love for volunteerism because as Mayor Bly said, we served on a lot of committees and a lot of boards unpaid because we were servants. And so people knew me by the community service that I did throughout the community. And I think that was certainly helpful in my quest to go on to be discovered first government job with the Jefferson County Clerk's Office. In fact, I was giving a free speech at a luncheon and that's how she discovered me and asked me to join her team when she won the election. So it's being out there and being visible and, pe and it's not who you know, it's who knows you and who respects what you do and, and can see that you do it for not the recognition, but the love of being a public servant. Thank you for that. And Angela Evans, Angela, if I may, uh, give us a little bit on, in terms of that particular piece. You're on mute now. Um, tell us a little bit about that particular piece that we're talking about. There. I had this preparation side of yeah, um, well, you know, my resume looks like it's just a, a, lot, a hodgepodge, but, uh, you know, I think everything led me to this. You know, I, I started as a public defender and knew that's what I wanted to do out of law school. But then, you know, just as you're finding yourself as a young attorney, you know, I went into state government and was, you know, happy there. But that's where I got to know people, you know, and, you know, looking for mentors and, uh, you know, just trying to figure out what this 30 year old something at the time, you know, really wanted to do. And I was introduced to the Emerge Kentucky program. And, you know, my, I, I was just always the person who wanted to serve. A lot of us have talked about that, just wanting to be a public servant. Again, my bachelor's is in social work. So that's all I wanted to do was, you know, was just help people. And 
you know, being in government uh, and finding ways to do that. So Emerge Kentucky, you know, trains women to run for office. And I, the stars finally aligned to do that. So that gave me a foundation about the idea of running for office. Um, you know, as a, as an attorney, I guess probably everyone fantasizes about maybe being a judge someday. And uh, of course, that's what I thought about. But lo and behold, that's not what I want to do. <laughs> I went to this route. But um, but yeah, the the preparation and you know my background. I'm like Kimberly, born and raised right here in Lexington. So I had a a, a family foundation, a friends and family foundation, and um, you know a relationship foundation. And uh, you know just building from people that I knew in Frankfurt who know other people. And I was on city council as well for six years. And again, people see me in that public servant role and learning learning about me and, and knowing, you know, how much my, my own personality. And then I really was generally trying to help people, you know, that um that spread beyond, you know, my sixth district council. Uh and so I think that was a lot of what helped me as well, that you know, people start to know you. And no, I was surprised at how many people actually watch council meetings. So, so you know, when I would go knock on doors, they they already knew about me. You know, they paid attention. So, a lot of that was um, a large part of the reason that I, I had the foundation and that people already knew something about me. But then also having just you know the person who wasn't paying attention to anything said, "Oh, she's been on city council. She's just not coming out of the woodworks and wanting to run for this." And you know, I will say age does have something to do with it as well. You know, I've practiced for 22 years at this point. So, um, you know, it's just not, you know, the new kid on the block just deciding to run for something. Like, you know, we've probably talked about that uh, periodically, but there was a true foundation in government, public service, being elected before. I think that added a whole lot of um, trust and uh, understanding of what who I was as a candidate when I was knocking on doors for this new position that quite frankly a lot of people didn't expect me to do so um, but I think that was people knowing me and knowing who I was as a public servant um, was really helpful. Well, thank you for that. Kimberly uh, if I will may uh, uh, what was your background? What, what was the preparation? I, I, we've already heard that you've been in the Commonwealth Attorney's Office for a period of years, which also, like Angela, you had to have a background uh, in law to do that sort of thing. But what else is involved in that? What else is involved in your preparation along with what you've already spoken of? Well, similarly to um, the others on the panel, mine was also community service. My mother um, always instilled in me, you know, giving back to the community in which you serve. And so since I was little, I was going with her um, doing things and being born and raised in Lexington for doing that, you know, for all those years, people knew who I was. Um, you know, I was sitting on my resume with all of my boards and unpaid yes <laughs> boards and that kind of thing. And I was sending it out to somebody and one of my coworkers was saying, well, you're supposed to have that on one page. And I was like, well, that's gonna be a little bitty font because I don't know how I'm gonna get that all on one page for things that I was doing, you know, even in the, I mean, I dropped some off, <laughs> you know, and this was just called, in the last few years. And um, I was also speaking to a group of law students and I said, always be mindful because you never know who's watching you. You never know who's looking at you and then getting inspiration for you. And what I realized about that, you know, when I, I never wanted, I didn't start out thinking I wanted to be a prosecutor at all. I wanted to be a defense attorney because I wanted to help people and I wanted to be a help in the system. And then when I met my, my first boss, Ray Larson, who basically told me, you know, as a defense attorney, you're just helping people one case at a time. When you are a prosecutor, you help everybody in the system. Your job legally is to make sure the rights of defendants are protected and to give the victim a voice and to protect the rights of the community. So it kind of rolled up my whole help. Um, and so that's what kind of kept me here, um, you know, in this office and people are seeing me and I think it brings credibility to, to this office you know, and what we do when people know me and know my heart and know what I'm trying to do is to be helpful. So that's pretty much kind of the path that I took to get here. Now, I also thought I was going to, I was doing that as first assistant and doing that, just kind of working my way in 26 years, being in the background. 
Um, what I didn't know, or I guess really didn't realize when I say you never know who's watching, the support I got when the question when my boss said she was retiring and everybody was like oh it's a shoe when you're gonna get it and i was like well you know what <laughs> politics is no joke so i you know i don't know the answer to that but the outpouring of support for me um being in here is because they saw me and saw my heart and so you know i have to gear up now all of you all did this and paved the way for me so i have to gear up to run next year next two years actually um i will run and so i think that that work in the community um, and that support that I've gotten from so many people, black and white, um, is, is kind of what's preparing me for, for that run. Well, you know what, uh, you make an interesting point when uh, you were told that a uh, defense attorney uh, represents an individual, and that's a very crucial aspect of the criminal justice system with respect to that, but that a prosecutor represents the Commonwealth, basically. And, uh, and their responsibility is not primarily to prosecute, but to see that justice is done. Correct. It's that's something correct. That a lot of people can't get their arms around. So uh, I think that's a good point to make. So we have, I got to say this again. We have mayor-elect James Atkins. I got to say that because this is the first time in the seat. Everyone else has traveled a journey to a certain point You've traveled a journey, but you're getting ready to take that step into that seat. So give us a little idea of what that means in your head. What do you what do you think you're stepping into and what are your aspirations in that position as mayor of Danville? Well, well first of all, let's go back 12 years ago. You know, to serve on the city commission for 12 years, you know, I've been sitting right there beside the mayor when the mayor's been outside of the community. Uh, I've uh, stood in his, uh, his stead. So I sort of know what I'm getting involved in, but I want to stress the fact that uh, Danvers politics is a little different from politics around the state of Kentucky in the fact that we have a city manager form of government. So you have a mayor and you have four city commissioners who are doing policies and procedures and listening to lots of people's and their concerns and stuff, but. Our city manager does the day-by-day -day operations of the city along with the department heads. So it makes it a little different. Um, but I, I tell folks that uh, my campaign slogan was vote Atkins to people's mayor. And that I stood on the foundation that I was going to support and serve all the people who voted for me to support and serve all those who voted against me but also to support and serve all those who did not vote at all in the past election. So the people's mayor has to represent and be willing to listen to, to everybody. And then the other point I wanna stress is that I'm the mayor of the city, but in the city of Danville, there's Junction City, there's Purple, and there's all of Boyle County. So whatever happens in Danville impacts the other two cities as well as it impacts the entire county and vice versa. So I look forward to bringing a a collaboration effort to Boyle County, the county judge exec, the two other mayors, the magistrates, the other city commissioners and councils. We've all got to come together and work to the betterment of our entire county for all of our citizens. And uh, that's what the people's mayor intends to do. Well, you know, you're a mayor elect of uh, Danville, but there's also an African American who was elected mayor is now mayor elect of Georgetown, Kentucky. Yes, sir. A different yeah. form of government. Tell us a little yes. bit what you know about yeah. it. Well, I don't know a lot about him, except again, uh, it's all of us former educators who have taught our citizens, our students, how to be good citizens. So uh, he plans to model servant leadership, just like he modeled it in the classroom. And uh, so uh, Reverend, Reverend Blythe and I have been and lots of different things together in our tenure uh, uh, in government positions. And we will bring him along just like uh, Reverend Blythe and like Ann Sleet and like other people who've been in the mayor's job throughout the state of Kentucky. Well, you know, they've pulled me along and uh, I stand on their shoulders. And so uh, I told the guy in uh, Georgetown, uh, welcome to the position. And uh, find you somebody whose shoulders you're standing on and uh, ask them for lots of support. And so we'll give him lots of support as well, though. 
Absolutely. So let's, 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 go ahead. let me say this too. Uh, go ahead. There was an African American female in Camusville running for the mayor of Camusville who did not get out of the primary. And then there was an African American female who was running for the mayor's job of Paris, Kentucky, who did not win. So there were several of us out there, you know, trying to give each other some support. Yeah. You know, I, I have to admire, having been in politics for a number of years myself, uh, you're getting taken on these challenges uh, because I know, at least from my perspective, what's involved there. I don't know all the detailed things, but each of these positions hold challenges <laughs> of achievement, whether you're elected or whether you're appointed. Uh, it's not automatic. I think I'm, I'm hearing that. So perhaps we can get into some of those challenges, but I want to get into challenges from this particular perspective. Where did race play into this? How did it play into this? Hmm. What were your perceptions about it? And perhaps we can have a candid view into this particular piece, because some of those issues uh, keep some people from stepping forward. And on other levels, there is a reality to yes. our history of racism in this country and certainly in Kentucky as well. How did that play into your journeys into where you're going? And I'm sure they're all different in some way. And I bet you we'll find something that's kind of common, all well, of them as well. I'm going to well, jump around a little bit. Let me jump around a bit on that. Let me, let me go to Paula McCraney just for a second. I want to, she's been serving the position for a while. And I want to understand that. You said that your district was some 90 something percent white as opposed to African American. How could you, given our history, rise to the top of that situation? What challenges did you have that particularly were impacted by your perception or reality of race? Well, yes, it's a 92% white district. And when I decided to run, I asked some people would they support me? And so racism played a part, not only with whites, but also with blacks. Because, huh. well, yeah. because, well, with, with, with the blacks, you know, their take on it was, there's no way that you're going to win in a 92% white district. And so that in and of itself was discouraging, but, you know, a bit on the racist side as well in a, in a different kind of manner. But when I talk with a numbers guy, and that's what I am, I'm a former banker, I'm a numbers person. So I wanted to see what the possibilities were mathematically and statistically. And so as we looked at the numbers, while we were slightly behind as far as Democrat votes and getting out the vote for Democrat residents, I said to myself, what I could do is make sure I got, got out the vote. That was how I was going to win. Mm -hmm. and, and I worked hard at trying to meet as many people in the district as possible to let them know about my qualifications. Now, I do believe that it was based solely on my qualifications. The fact that you know, I had a master's degree at the time. I'm working on a doctorate now, but back then I only had, I had a master's degree. I had been in leadership Louisville. I had graduated from several key community forums and, and, and entities. So people were impressed with the background and they knew that I was capable of doing the job. So that's what I had to prove. But let me tell you, when I started running, that was the key to my success, selling my background, selling my capabilities. And when I finally won in 2018, I was at a function and this constituent who he knows who he is, so I won't say his name, but he's <laughs> pretty wealthy in this community. He came up to me at this function and he said to me, and this is where, where race reared it, its ugly head in a different manner. I had won the race, but he came up to me in, in the middle of a crowded gathering and said, I've been thinking about this. I think I know why you won the race. I'm waiting for him to tell me that he saw a gazillion of my yard signs, 
that my material was great or my background was solid. But what he said to me was, I don't believe the people in District 7 knew you were Black. Now, try that on for size. So in other words, if they would have known I was Black, they may not have voted for me. But the fun thing about it is, everything that I sent out had my picture on it. So I don't know how they didn't know. Maybe they didn't want to know, but they did vote for me. Yeah. Well, let, let, me, let's, let me just ask you a quick question on that. Because uh, I'm, 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 I'm not sure racism equates to someone not believing you can achieve something in the elections given our racial history. What I'm looking for, what specific act that was taken against you, a negative act, if any, uh, in any of your two campaigns, two campaigns, right? Yes, this, I, this recent I, I'm general sure. election. Right. Well, let me just tell you, this is, this is what happened this time. Material was sent out to say that she wants to spend all of your money on reparations to, uh, to, for slavery. Now, I don't know where that fits into anything, but that was on the campaign material. And it was also stated many a times that I was anti-police, I was a, a, an activist, Black Lives Matter. Now, those were racist dog whistles that I can say were thrown out there to scare the, the people in this district. And they know that those were buzzwords that were not only used in this particular race and on a local level, but it was also the same dog whistles that you found in federal races. So th that's why I know they thought that they would at least not get me reelected based on they were gonna scare the base with race baiting. And, I, and, and that was unfortunate, it really was. It got so ridiculous that constituents were calling me, the people had, that I have already served for four years, they were calling me to say how disgusted they were with the materials they were getting and that they hoped that I would fight back and put some negativity out there on my opponents. I chose not to do that, but it, it got so ridiculous that I believe people said, this is so absurd that I will not vote against her based on this information. I'm going to vote for her based on her qualifications and the work that she hey. has done. So Angela, you, you, you've been out there somewhat. Did you have a similar experience or did you have a different experience? Uh, uh, similar. Uh, <laughs> um, Mine was more, I, I don't, I didn't hear of any like, actual material that was being hand, handed out or mailed out, but it definitely was the dog whistle of, oh, well, since she spoke it, well, let, you know what, let me, let me back up because having served on council, when I was on council, one of the last conversations, discussions we had was about um, banning no knocks. And I, we, we had a time where we were simply trying to get information and the council be educated on no knocks. And there was a council meeting where I and some other council members were doxxed. So our information was put out there. Um, we had calls coming in using the N word, I mean, to the, I just constantly to the point where um, you know, our, Commissioner of Public Safety just decided that some of us were gonna get extra security um, that night because they just didn't know what was gonna happen. So just simply asking questions about police operations to some makes you a threat, an enemy of police. Um, so that was out there. Uh, so yeah, when I decided to run for county attorney, that was still lingering. Um, you know, where there were the rumors that I heard that I was just going to hire, you know, a lot of these, um, a lot of the Black Lives Matter protesters. You know, I was going to fire everybody uh, that was already there, and just a lot of that um, instilling the fear, like Paula was talking about, based on race, 
and racial issues. So it wasn't necessarily something that the public heard, but it was it definitely got back to me. So if it got back to me, then it was it was out there in in the community. So that that's how I experienced it. Let me ask you, did, were you reactive to that in a negative way or did you follow the route that uh, uh, Council, Councilwoman District 7 McCraney followed? And that is not to respond in a negative way. Uh, no, I, I didn't respond to it because when I, I've always been, and I've prided myself in being the person who asks questions on council. I, I will ask the hard questions and you know, and it, honestly, the result of being doxxed and all that, that was something council needed to see at the time. They needed to know that this could be the response. Um, I think a lot of them just were completely floored. But no, because I knew what that was. You know, I, I knew it was people just out of fear, just wanting to, you know, pull at any thread to get people to, to not vote for me. But Again, people know me and they know my character and they know my integrity. So it was just easier to not even address it because um, I know that was in a small circle. And then honestly, my demographic, my, you know, this being the county attorney, it's a partisan race. So, you know, given, you know, the democratic issues, you know, <laughs> I, 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 I'm, my campaign was geared toward a certain electorate, you know, especially for the primary. So yeah, throw out all of that stuff at me because, you know, that's my base, the general, you know, primary Democratic voter. I'm basically in line, you know, with um, with those platforms, if that's what they wanted to throw out there. So, so no, I, I didn't address it just because I knew what my what my platform was and that people knew me. And um, they were just like you said, the whistles to to try and bait me. And I just wasn't going to do that. Janelle, may I just make a, a quick statement? Sure. Oh, okay. So while I say I did not go negative, what happened, and this was just a miracle, and I love telling this story quickly. I was sitting at my computer at, at, in my home office, and my husband came home and gave me the mail. In the mail was the worst mailer that had been sent out on me to date, and this was three weeks before the election. I didn't have much money left in the coffers, but when I saw this and I saw that it said, when it comes to crime, Paula McCraney is the worst. And when they said that I was anti-police and I was uh, going to spend their money on reparations, when this was the mailer, it was so dastardly that as I'm sitting there reading this mailer, in pops from the printer, my last mailer that I was going to send out and they wanted me to proof it. We only had three weeks, so we were up against the clock. When I saw that mailer, I called the printer immediately and said, I know you don't have much time to do this, but can I change this mailer and just by the grace of God, they were able to accommodate me. I changed that mailer, which was supposed to be on infrastructure and how I have done all the work to secure monies to do roads and streets and sidewalks. But I changed that mailer to address the issues that were in that particular mailer from my opponent. And I told them, they said I had been missing for two years from downtown, from city council. That's absurd. So in that mailer, I talked about being 90 some percent present at all council meetings. I talked about, and they said I was being backed by anti-police protesters. And I was, and I showed exactly who I was being endorsed by, which were realtors and, and citizens and, you know, just honest, so Every basically, day. basically, you you dealt with it factually. You correct. I, I dealt with it factually, and I Understood. and so I think that yeah. was more my personality and what really got to the citizens of the community, and they were very happy that I was able to address those issues. But it was just by the grace of God that that timing was perfect. Well, that's great, Kimberly. I'm going to save 
uh, Robert Blythe to the end because he's got that longest tenure, and I want to I want him to wrap that particular aspect of what we're talking about. But I want Kimberly. Then I want to get back to Mary Lake Atkins, Kimberly. We're we're talking we're talking about challenges, particularly around I, race. If I, right. Well, what I was going to say was there's a couple of things. So one of them, the very example I was putting on was what Angela talked about at City Council. And so I was there watching that, you know, and kind of, you know, watching the non Zoom and those kinds of things and the hatred that was spewed that way. And it was talking about police issues because we had had some protests and some frank conversations with the mayor about, and it was in light of the Breonna Taylor, you know, uh, shooting the head of her. I'm so freezing. Of, that uh, means I'm freezing. Huh? Everybody, uh, my apologies. Let's go back, Kimberly. Oh, that's okay. So I was talking about the example that Angela had given. And, um, and so people were calling in, they were, the council was having discussions about things that had happened in Louisville, and, and as it relates to Lexington, and just the hatred and that kind of thing, because asking the questions implied that they were anti police. And so looking at me as a prosecutor, then I was who's supposed to be the friend of the police, there was a lot of, um, educating and a lot of discussions that needed to be happening. And I could tell there was um, there was some uncomfortableness. They know me. And so they were trying to talk with me, but a lot of it is, okay, so, you know, so are you following along the line? What are we going to do? Those types of things. So it, it was, it made for some very uncomfortable conversations on some of them, not only people in the office, but also um, those who didn't understand the movements, those that understand what Blue Lives Matter to, I was like, well, that's not what we're talking about. So there was a lot of conversation about that, um, that, that took a lot of navigating um, to deal with that. I'll also say, um, which is probably not where we're going with this, but I do want to say this. When we started, when I started as the prosecutor, a lot of the comments of, are you prosecuting your own people? came from my African-American law students, my brothers and sisters, because they didn't understand that what a prosecutor does, that's what they had in their head. Um, you're prosecuting them. And so it took a lot of um, building my that trust um, and, and them understanding who I am and understanding you still have to have a seat at the table because if you don't have representation in the, in the Commonwealth Attorney's Office, you're always going to think that there's something. So when I say to them, I'm trying to make sure you understand what's happening here and making sure there's representation, there is still this distrust. And a lot of it is coming just from the African-American community. So when I tell you I have to build relationships with both, <laughs> with everybody in the community, um, it's, it's, it's a thing. <laughs> I mean, it, it's, it's hard. It's very hard because we've got a lot of things that are happening um, that, that people have to, to get out of their heads. So, so with the history that we have, it's a more complex thing as being getting dynamics that just involve one side. In your particular uh, experience, it's, it's, uh, it's played out in both directions uh, yes. for different reasons. Yes, for different reasons. That's exactly right. Yeah. So, Mayor Lack Atkins, my friend James, what do you see? Our, our, you've been on the council. You know what it's about. What do you think will be the challenges and what challenges did you have, if any, when you were running as it relates to race? Well, first of all, let's just acknowledge the fact that we're all African-Americans. And uh, with that comes a very obvious challenge. Uh, if I go back to May in this primary, uh, there was a white female running and two African-American males. And uh, I don't know what that was all about, but in the end, in the primary, the two African-American males came out as the top two vote getters. So from the primary to the general election, you had two African-American males uh, running to become the next mayor of the fine city of Danville. And so the race card was played, but against me. But what I would like to say is that uh, something that was really uh, more relevant so the whole process was the fact that it was a nonpartisan race and that it was very obvious that one party was uh, leaning very heavily toward a particular candidate whose uh, last name was not Atkins. And uh, it got to the point where um, 
even the yard signs and the four by four signs and the eight by eight signs and everything else, uh, you saw um, signs connected, not just in the same yards, but I mean connected by the wooden frames. <laughs> Uh, and you could see that it was very obvious that I have a broad base of people walking in, the, in, my, orga in my organization, but it's very obvious that uh, the partisanship became very obvious in uh, this uh, last election here in our community. Uh, so I'm concerned about that because uh, someone mentioned earlier about it, it looks like the state of the national politics and if it's creeping down into the local politics, politics where you can't even have a nonpartisan election, uh, involving two African-American males, uh, things are going to get pretty tough for us in our community and in our, in our state. Uh, and so, so my challenge is that I, I have uh, talked to the, my opponent's father because he was uh, uh, been a good friend of mine for a long time. And I said, you know, it boiled down to Atkins had a whole lot of experience and it became very obvious when he talked to people. And the other candidate had zero experience in uh, government, except for his service in the military. And so eventually it came out where, okay, well, uh, Atkins was a, a veteran as well. And I've really never used that as a part of a platform, but you have to use what you, you have to use. So I, I am trying to reach out to uh, my opponent and some of his backers and say, we need to come sit at the table because we all sort of do look and sound and smell the same. So. Let's get together and see if we can find ways to move this community forward. I am the mayor, but as the mayor, I'm not gonna move it forward by myself. Um, but I also wanna say, I think it failed in our community that uh, the black community was not split by this effort. And I think that if you look at the mayor who won and the four city commissioners, uh, it was all of us who stayed true to the nonpartisan part of the campaign. And that's what won out in Danville, Kentucky. Well, you know, that raises an interesting point because I all the way through this piece, when I raised the question of race, you can't do it separate from the issues yes. that are raised or those you advocate are those that are used against you, yes. uh, such as the to reparations, et cetera. And I guess the other difference, even though you had a nonpartisan election, in other words, it wasn't this party versus that party, necessarily, uh, perhaps you did have some influence of race and partisanship in that same process. It's, it's more complex than what meets the eyes, I guess yeah, is most, what I'm saying. But most definitely, yes. Yeah, so so now I'm gonna turn to uh, Robert Blake, Mayor of Richmond. You've been there a long time. You was on council a long time. You've had multiple experiences you must have had multiple challenges because as I understand, you're not only dealing with uh, the question of race and whatever iteration it was, but also you have from a, a partisan uh, position, you have a large Republican leaning constituency base as well. Is that accurate or, and if so, how did you navigate that? That is accurate. And in fact, perhaps most, if not all of central Kentucky, perhaps across the state, might recall that the January 6th, the infamous January 6th insurrection was attended by one of the city commissioners of the city of Richmond. Now, that, that's okay, so to speak, except that she sent selfies back to Richmond and, and the city became inflamed and the only things that many folks would say, and they were not ugly, they simply said, does she not know that she represents all of us? And I was afraid that that might turn our nonpartisan race into a, 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 with a partisan overtone. Well, I don't think it did uh, because I won with twice the margin I did the first time. Uh, and and uh, so I was really pleased with that. But um, Race, uh, let me, I taught uh, several years ago in one of our local county high schools where there were 900 students enrolled and exactly 1%, nine students were non-white. 
Now, I didn't go there as the black math teacher and the black French teacher. I went there as a math French teacher. But I, it came, it really came to me how those kids and their families felt about me. One day I was on the phone very quickly. I was on the phone with one of my students who had already graduated, was working for a business uh, that I did business with. And as I got ready to finish the phone call, it struck me. I said, oh, by the way, I would really appreciate your support in the election. This young fellow said to me, oh, Mr. Blythe, your students are gonna elect you. I thought, wow, because what he was talking about was white voters. Now, uh, that's been the way it is. I've taught, I've served, and uh, the one thing that concerns me even right now is that I am the only to date and uh, 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 to date uh, a serving official. And uh, I'm, I'm really trying uh, to get someone to consider. One of the things I have been able to do when somebody who happened to be black said to me, well, well what, you, what are you doing for the black people? <laughs> I've been able to strengthen, I will say, the presence of African-Americans in all of our boards and commissions. And, uh, and that's where I feel we can be really effective making the decisions that will affect everybody in our town. That, that's, that's where the race shows up because folks know that I will treat everyone right. That was my only commitment, the only promise I made that I would treat everyone right. You know, what comes up in this discussion is being in position is what enables you to further the discussion as it relates to race and have more representation with respect to that. It's one thing to be out of position and advocate. It's one thing to be in position and uh, believers that are necessary to make change. Uh, I see yeah. that, but there's something else you raised. So me... part, but before we go to that, before you go to that, I want to thank uh, WLU Radio uh, for joining us uh, during this particular session uh, as it relates to AAI's Race and Politics Summit. That's WLOU, which is uh, uh, 104.7 uh, FM or 1350 AM on your dial. Uh, Mayor Blake, I mean, Mayor Atkins, you were saying something. Yeah, I want I want to make a point. Yeah, I want to send out a, a kudos for the city of Danville. Give you a good subject for your one of your programs. The uh, chief of police in the city of Danville is an African-American. The superintendent of the city schools in Danville is an oh, African Hold on, let's not play that game. We, we got three. <laughs> let me, let me, I'm just messing with you. Let, All let of me, our law enforcement is. <laughs> yeah, let, let, let me go on, though. We're, we, uh, in January, we stand to elect the African American as the chairman of the Board of Education. And, uh, you know, sometime here in December, I'm going to be sworn in as an African American mayor. So, uh, there's a little bit of uh, color on the rising in Dable and Boyle County. Well, let me let me let me let me point out that uh, we have different dynamics in different areas, and yes. I don't think yes. uh, we can diminish the challenge that yes. African Americans have not only in uh, Louisville or Lexington or Kentucky, but across the United States of America, indeed the world. There are challenges yes. across the board. And I applaud all of you all for the work that you do. And I think it's very important work, but the dynamics in these areas are very different. But something came up that uh, Robert Blatt's raised that I thought was really important. And that was the national impact. The, how, this is, how is this dynamic unfolding under the lens of national politics? Uh, think about that just for a minute. I'd be interested, and anyone can jump in on this. And the first one gets in there, we'll yield to the other. But how do you view the national politics? Think about it for a minute. Yep. Arizona, if you take it in consideration, was expected to be uh, something that uh, enabled, uh, in this instance, uh, Donald Trump, the Republican, to, to make a, a, a run through. Uh, if you look at Nevada, across the board, the so called uh, red 
um, piece didn't unfold except into a tri trickle. Now I'm trying to understand how it was in the local level. Did they, or was the politics so local that it didn't have anything to do with the overall attitude that we've observed uh, politically in our country? Who, who wants to grab that one? Jared, I'll chime in on that. Cause, I, cause again, I think it was most reflective um, here on our city council. And, you know, I, I'm over here in the, in the county attorney, but I still pay attention to uh, what's happening on council having been there because this year from, or this election cycle, from what I've been told, and I think Mayor Blythe is, is correct that, um, you know, we have probably the most progressive um, council, you know, I'll, I'll use that word for however you want to put it, but the most progressive council that was elected and the most diverse, but each one of those races was contested. And there seemed to be a concerted effort um, from what I was told, I, I did not research this, but a lot of the incumbent council members had someone from that was had a law enforcement background, which again goes back to um, what Paula was talking about with you know that you know these whistles that um, and phrases that are used. So I, I think it is uh, it is trickling into local uh, elections and. I very much expect to have a Republican candidate um, next time because that that was part of uh, you know me winning that I think the Republican Party got so comfortable with you know my opposition being there and happy doing with whatever he was doing that um, they never you know considered putting up a candidate. So I I think nationally is trickling down to the, the local elections and I would put everyone on um, not notice but to be aware that everyone um, that it, it's trickling in regardless of whether you have a partisan or nonpartisan government it is trickling in so so what are you learning from this what lessons are you learning from this um, I'm thinking you're going to get different kinds of lessons, maybe, I'm not sure, because I've heard uh, um, James Atkins uh, tout, well, we have, we have evidence of progress where we are. Of course, now we know there's nonpartisan elections, at least in part there, but that does tell us something. And in some of the other areas, we, uh, I'm hearing the conversation in terms of those individuals who really come from a different reality, you come from a larger base that you have to deal with in terms of, of uh, being elected in the situation. I mean, there's a big difference also on the levels of what you're doing. Many of you have been on councils, for instance, what uh, Paula McCraney deals with in, a, in the, the most major urban area in the state of Kentucky, has to have some difference what lessons are you learning? And, and just, just pile on wherever you wish, but what lessons are you learning from the experiences that you're having, particularly as it relates to race and politics? Well, but, let me just say that uh, politics should be local, right? We've heard yeah. that term before, all politics are local. But the truth of the matter is, it depends on who is at that head ticket at the federal level and what is going on there. People are paying attention and they equate your race and your, if you are in a partisan race, your politic and your affiliation with your, with, with your actual uh, camp on how they view you. So yeah. the lesson that I learned was not to depart from my goals and my aspirations and my beliefs, but to be a more moderate Democrat so that I can appeal to everybody. And you can't run a race in a district like ours being extremely partisan or extreme at all. So, so that's the lesson. We have to be willing not to compromise our beliefs and what we hold true to our party, but to understand we're representing everyone. And there is a little bit of good in every party. And so my races 
each both races have always been to represent everyone. So pick out the good in each party and stress how I can help in that regard and how I can be of service in those areas. But I can tell you that if I was running and I did, ran as a Democrat, I never put Democrat on my materials. People knew I was a Democrat, but that's a lesson that you have to learn. And, <laughs> and, and once they want to talk about what's going on at the national level, they will ask you your opinion. People, although I am about roads, sidewalks, uh, your uh, drainage issues, and, <laughs> and writing some legislation and, and, and on approving budgets, that's basically what a city council person does. But they wanna know your opinion about abortions. They wanted to know how I felt about uh, you know, Roe versus Wade and, and, and the student loan forgiveness. They ask those questions. So you have to be prepared to understand what's going on at the, lo at the national level in order to kind of get past all of that in order to get into the local level issues that they really should be concerned about. So I expect that. I expect that when I hear about a mayor, when I hear about a council person, but what about county attorneys and commonwealth attorneys? Do they expect you to know all these issues as well when you're campaigning? Mm -hmm. I guess I'm Mr. Kimberly and, and Angela. It hasn't really, um, I've gone through two election cycles with my bosses and it's really not been that questions have come up like she was talking about, you know, like the biggest thing now, if there was a, um, you know, would we prosecute someone, you know, that was, um, you know, that performed an abortion and those kinds of things, those questions come up, but it doesn't really, it so far has not really affected um, kind of the race or we're going to put somebody up because you said something different. Um, and I think that comes from, um, like Paula said, you have to m maintain the message that you are representing everybody and you are being fair and you are seeking justice and you're going to um, apply the laws um, as written and do it equally. And so I don't think that so far those, I mean, I've heard it, but so far those issues hasn't caused someone to jump in against you know, our incumbents to say, you're gonna say something or you're gonna do something different so we're gonna put somebody up um, against you. So, so far that hasn't been our experience. Hopefully they'll stay that way. Well, yeah, let's cross our fingers so that way I can stay. But um, I, I would agree it hasn't happened yet, but I will say um, the more dysfunctional um, Congress gets, the more responsibility that local governments are going to have to act because, you know, you're, the state legislature um, is becoming just as stalemated as, as Congress just across the country. Um, and that was part of the issue in educating people about what the, the county attorney's office did, that was actually something I used because President Biden at one point during the campaign did say it's gonna be up to local elected officials to stop some of this legislation or to use their discretion in prosecution. And it was about um, you know abortion specifically. So I think that's gonna be the problem that we as local officials are gonna have, it's when you know, our higher ups decide not to act or do something that you know, is extreme in one way or the other that you know, we know as the people that get stopped in the grocery store or that are there to you know, do justice for people. Um, you know, is that really what's right for you know, the, the city of Danville or Louisville or you know, Lexington? And it's going to be up to us to, I think, take those stances, which I think it is going to unfortunately become more uncomfortable because now we have an electorate that is more aware and is getting more engaged. Um, but yeah, unfortunately, I think the more partisan state and federal legislators get, it's going to fall back on us. Well, yeah. Oh, that's, uh, yes, go ahead. I, uh, I gave a shout out for the city 
now I'll give a shout out for the county. All right, these are all partisan races. Our uh, county judge exec, newly elected as a Democrat, and uh, four out of the six uh, magistrates are Republican, and all of the countywide seats in Boyle County were uh, won by Republicans. So it is it's coming to our community. Yeah. Uh, uh, what, what, do you, what, what conclusion do you draw from that? Well, I, I think it's part of they're, they're using the same uh, tactics that are being used at the state and at the, at the federal level in, in local uh, selection of candidates and then how they operate their campaigns on the local level. Yeah. Anyone else want to jump in on that one? Well, let me go on to this. Do any of you feel or have experienced what you might consider being undue scrutiny as you perceive it because of your race? Hmm. I know it might be a little bit to untangle that in terms of partisan politics, for instance, but I'm particularly interested in race. Uh, any of you, uh, can you point to or can you express um, an experience or some perspective that you have that you were subject to greater scrutiny uh, because of your race? I don't know that I can tie this, the first part that I'm going to jump to in on that one. Can you hear me? I, I don't know if I can tie this directly into race, this first part that I'm going to say. But I can tell you that there has always been a white Republican in this seat. And so when I came on board, I was getting requests that of things that should have been taken care of years before I got on the council. But I think that I was held to a higher standard and I and, and more scrutiny. And they expected me to, to act on things that if they would have held the others accountable, maybe they would have already been done, but they didn't. They just allowed them to, to represent them as they, as they allow uh, themselves to represent. But for me, they expected me to do more than my predecessors had ever done. Case in point, there was a couple of homes that needed to be foreclosed on. And when I got the call and people knocking on my door, literally knocking on my door in my neighborhood to ask me to take care of this, this one home, when I researched it, this had been going on for 10 years. And they expected me to get it done and get it done that year. And I was told, and it takes a, you all know, it takes a while to get a home foreclosed on. But I was told, we will not reelect you if you can't get this done. And so I would get common threats like that all the time. And then let's fast forward to 2020 when civil unrest happened. My district residents were emailing me, wanting me to speak on behalf of the Black population. One lady would say, what do Black people want? And so I was supposed to know and I was supposed to educate her. But as I got those requests to uh, for them to understand what was going on, they were so fearful and they were so afraid and they looked to me for answers. I took on that mantle. I really did. And I decided to educate my constituents on the fact that they must get involved and understand what the issues are on their own that I was not a spokesperson for any one race. And I invited them to certain functions and certain places where they could experience for themselves. And I sent out a list of books for them to read because if they didn't know, that's because they didn't want to know. So I thought that let me take this opportunity now to express to them, I am not the black representative of District 7. I am the representative of District 7. And you know, you have to earn some respect. And so I did that in a matter of education. You know, I, I think that duplicity took place when you when I analyzed the situations related to 
uh, former President Barack Obama, um, I would hear some people criticize uh, his representation because I think they do, at least in my view, define him as a representative of the Black community when as president, as you know, he was president of the entire country and he was representative of that and, 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 and all that that meant and that included the Black community, but not solely the representative of the Black community. That duality posed all kinds of, of uh, perspectives and, and expectations and so forth that's caught up in this whole mix given our history. With respect to that, does anyone else, uh, Paul, I think you very beautifully laid that out in terms of the dynamics there. Did anyone else uh, experience something different or something akin to what uh, has been expressed? Has it been a very complex piece uh, in terms of how you perceive and how you negotiate um, your responsibility? Well, I think, it, again, it's obvious that we're perceived as being a spokesperson for the Black community. Uh, like Paula, I probably have 10 or 11 percent uh, people of color, uh, Hispanic and everything else included. Uh, but I, I, I think her piece about the education has to be the, the key for all of those of us who are people of color who desire to, to seek office. You, know, you get out and you serve, but, but while you're serving, you also have got to educate folks to the fact that, hey, I don't speak for the black community. I sure don't speak for the white community. But I attempt to educate myself personally on the issues so that I can speak on behalf of what's right for, for all of the citizens. You know, Black folks would say, hey, Atkins, what have you done for me lately? And I said, well, we just um, gave all the city employees a 3%, 4%, 5% raise. Oh, you did? Well, yeah, didn't you fill it in your paycheck? Uh, well, I didn't know you did that. Well, I didn't do it. The whole commission did it. You know, so, so we do things in these positions that are to see to be just for the white folks, we have to educate our folks that they're for all citizens, that black folks benefit from. You no, know, we built a new fire station. Well, you built it downtown for the white folks. I said, yeah, but uh, you live close enough, your insurance uh, probably went down because we built it in that location. So uh, we, we do good things in these positions for all of our citizens, not for one particular race or ethnicity or social economic class or whatever it might be. You know, my observation is, and particularly from the state level, um, and, and I represent a, a, a district now that's probably 53% African-American. So I think it's arguably, um, I get to see both sides of these pieces and my district has changed from point to point. But i tell you an observation I've made is that um, we were talking about the reaction and perception of the black community. I saw that from the white community side, you know, uh, and it's expressed in different ways, such as all that you do is benefiting what? Black folks, they get in everything and therefore that becomes part of the resistance to a partisan aspect, which has a racial overtone. And when you start looking at the numbers, you find out that the majority of societies get the benefit as opposed to black community. But that racial piece, the exploitation, uh, the, the uh, lack of education, uh, as you pointed out several times with respect to that, and the uh, heavy flow of misinformation uh, colors all of this. So it looks like from that standpoint, we've got a long way to go uh, as it relates to this particular thing because of the dynamics of racism, classism, and partisan politics uh, in that piece. But I'd be really interested, uh, uh, Robert Blythe, I really get, would like to really get your perspective on that. You've been there a long period of time, run a few times in your particular seat. Uh, what do we learn from that? I think, Any uh, observations? I think, first of all, uh, people realize that you really, those who are voting for you, you are voting, realize that you really do mean to serve all. That doesn't matter. And once again, uh, in my teaching days, especially in the, the four years at the uh, school in South County, and then uh, teaching at the university and running into all these folks who happen to be voters. But building relationship is key. It's, and, and let me, I don't know about the, but the rest of our group, 
But I am a member, a member and have been for several years of the local Richmond Rotary. I am a member of the local Kiwanis Club. And I have direct interaction with the folks of this community, even those who may not like me, I don't know, doesn't matter. I'm there, I'm a dues paying member and I am involved in projects with the group, uh, try to encourage the involvement of others uh, who are African-American. Um, I can't do any more than that. I mean, I, I put myself there with folks and, uh, and from there, I mean, some folks probably, or possibly, not probably, possibly won't like me. I can't, I can't say that they don't, but uh, I enjoy the interaction and that's crucial uh, when folks can do an up close relationship with you. You have to get out there. Does anybody have an experience that's counter to that or would like to add something to that? I think there's something to be said about that. You can't sit back and anticipate or speculate on what's going on. You actually have to run a campaign and folks right. are gonna have to understand that you're there to represent everyone's interests. There's no other way to run for a seat. But I'm always surprised, well, not surprised, but I've always observed that uh, black folks, particularly in Kentucky, have voted for white folks routinely. Um, there's been no issue as it relates to that. You go to the polls and you look for the person you think can best represent and best prepared to represent your interests. But I also have experienced a pushback because of race the other way, that this issue comes up as to whether a Black person, at least out of the history and experiences I've had, uh, is qualified or should be representing a particular district. So it's Senator, not necessarily a two-way. Does anyone else have Senator, a comment to make about that? Senator, may I say this, yes. please? Uh, when I was running the first please. time for, for mayor, I happened to be at a local radio station uh, and I was looking at some of the comments that were coming in. Now, there was this one fellow who made a comment that I've never forgotten. First time anyone uh, African-American had run for the office and so on, the only African-American who'd been elected. And his comment was, is this a joke? Mm -hmm. Now, I thought, okay, Robert, <laughs> gird up your loins here. but. But I thought that's the way some people will see it. In my first mayoral race, out of 8,000 plus votes, I lost by, I mean, excuse me, I won by 661. This time with about the same number of total votes, I won by 1,900. When I gave my state, uh, excuse me, my acceptance speech the night we were sworn in, I simply said this, I am grateful for the 4,661 who voted for me. And I accept the challenge mm -hmm. from the 4,000 who did not vote for me yeah. to do such a job as makes you think it was the right choice that I became mayor. That's about the best I can do. That's good. And I, Senator Neal, oh, go ahead, Angela. Oh, well, I... I I don't know how to, I'm going to try and say this delicately, and I don't mean offense to, to anyone, but I mean, acknowledging that there obviously still are, there, there is racism and, you know, race is a factor um, to a lot of people and understanding that Lexington and Louisville can be very different um, opposed to the rest of the state. You know, I, I do have to say that I don't, I think we are coming into like a new era of sorts. Um, you know, our, the people that vote, I mean, it's still the baby boomer generation who are the largest voters, but you know, you've got Gen X, which I'm a part of, I don't know um, who else is, but you know, Gen Xers were in our forties, might be in our fifties. And we grew up, you know, going to school together, you know, I, doing things together. So I think while there are still issues, we have a different perspective. And I don't, 
think race is as important um, to perhaps our generation as it may have been to others. I mean, I, I think Oops. we look for other things and not to say we're, we're better or anything, but I just think it's, you know, slightly diminished as a reason to not vote for someone. Um, so <clears throat> I think part of it is a generation change and shift. Um, and I can see where you're saying that. And it's absolutely true because I have children who are 30 and 32 years old and, and they they just don't understand the baby boomers and older and how we think and how we, you know, come together in this racist uh, mindset. But I can tell you that race is still prevalent because when 2020 happened, the civil unrest was very difficult for me in, in my situation. And I was only a one year, still a, a neophytes uh, uh, council person. But when 2020 happened, I can tell you that there were so many racist emails that I received, so many hate filled messages. And a lot of them who were okay with identifying themselves, they simply wanted to understand. And they really would, would ask questions like, not only what do the black people want, but they would say to me, after the civil unrest and then everybody was in this woke uh, mindset, the mayor started doing some things and there were things that were happening for the black community that now my constituents were saying, it seems like everybody's focused on the West side of Louisville. The West Louisville is getting so much money. West Louisville is being the center of attention. West Louisville is getting all of the money. And why are you voting on this? And why are you voting on that? And it was because they did see that we were basically trying to play catch up. And I don't think that's what white people understand, that Black people have been so far behind that trying to play catch up will never get there. I mean, I shouldn't say never, but it's very difficult for them to understand why now are monies being spent in the Black neighborhoods. And, and so you have to educate. Again, I chose to educate on redlining. I chose to educate on the school system and some of this, the disparity studies. So you, you know, you, this is what I have found that my task was bigger than just district seven and sidewalks and <laughs> drainage issues. I have to be very knowledgeable about what is going on, not only in the black community, which I don't represent, but I certainly have a seat at the table to make sure that I'm speaking for them. And I have to make sure I understand the mindset of my 92% white district, because a lot of them, they mean well, but they just don't get it. And so it's my task to bring them along delicately so that we can all be one community and, and understand the needs of everybody. One area of the city hurts, we all are affected. And I think that's why representation matters. And that's what we need to explain to people. But sometimes it comes out as, oh, well, I'm a black candidate, so you should just vote for me. And that's what people don't no. necessarily understand or appreciate, mm -hmm. or maybe, you know, in this like you said, time of wokeness, we're like, oh, okay, let's just vote for the black person to even it out kind of stuff. Um, but and and I was speaking, you know, specifically about candidates running. Yeah, the issues. Yeah, it, it's still there for sure. But um, I know I've just, as a candidate looking at things, you know, that, um, you know, people looking at candidates, I, I don't know, I think race might not necessarily um, be as potent or, you know, well, all Angela, being equal. Angela, uh, I, I will step in just a second. I would, I would say, I would say, and I'll throw this out there because our time is getting very short. Um, I, I think that racism is powerful, is quite alive, 
on multiple levels, some sub-levels, and we got a long way to go in racism. But having said that, the mindset that I'm hearing Angela express is akin to the mindset that I get from younger people, uh, including uh, my son, the 30-ish, the 40-ish type of folks, that this is not going to be, you know, someone said uh, uh, to Paula, someone, you can run, but uh, I don't think you can win. Well, the folks I run into that in that age group don't think like that. <laughs> they think like if it's out there and it's something they want to do and they have something to offer, they're going to offer themselves to it. That's a little different from saying that racism doesn't exist and it's strong, but it has a powerful effect on someone who's willing to put themselves out there, uh, even though that's out there, but that's not what motivates them. That's not the challenge that they have. Their challenge is winning that seat to do the best job that they can. Yeah. So Angela, I could gamble there on that particular expression, but that's been my operation. Everybody tear it up and give me one minute or less, each of you. What is your best advice? Well, I'm going to go first. Who happen to be people, excuse me, who happen to be people of color. One minute now. Who have, happen to be people. What is your advice in one minute to those who aspire for political office that look like us? A Angela and Paula just said it all in their last two or three comments. We have got to run with the purpose and the intent of just serving all. We've got to have a campaign that's got constituents of all ages, genders, races, whatever you want to call it. It's a, it's got to be inclusive anymore, and that's what makes us successful. Kimberly, I would say um, that they have to stay the course. Their mm -hmm. voice matters. Um, mm -hmm. They must be heard. They must be at the table, and they're not going to feel like there's change or feel like things are happening unless they get involved too. So I would say stay the course and, and make sure that your voice is heard. Paula. To my African-American friends, I would say, please invest in the right candidates, invest. We're not used to spending our monies on people, but if you have a black candidate that is of good will and qualified, you have to invest in them because had it not been for other people's money, I could not have run this race. So I wish that I could say that we support one another in the manner that other people have supported me, but that is not the case. So I would say, please invest in your people. To my white uh, friends and, and neighbors, I would say, do not let other people's racism become your racism. Be who you are and see the candidate and your representative for who they really are. Judge them by the content of their character and the work that they do, not by what other people might think in their racist attitudes. Angela. Going off of what Paula said, not just invest in candidates, potential candidates need to invest in themselves, meaning look at, analyze your own background. Don't just pick an office, pick an office that is good for you based on your background, that you can have the confidence in saying, I, I know what to do or in this office because of X, Y, and Z. I think that's part of um, where we kind of lose some ground is, you know, we're just kind of picking the, the biggest thing. Build yourself, really analyze yourself, your background, your education, your knowledge, and what you're passionate for, and select offices based on that, not just what looks shiny, and, and continue to build, get in there, and represent, you know, because you can educate people on every level of any office, from soil and water to president, you know, there, there are issues that you can, uh, you can find to educate everyone and build that relationship with the public. So when you do want to run for something much bigger or higher profile, people know you. Robert. I um, use what I call the, the drug approach. We've talked about that sometimes about how our parents drug us to church and so on. Well, 
What I do, <laughs> I take, I take folks that I know could serve well, who maybe haven't thought about it. I take them to meetings and events. I introduce them to people who can encourage them even further, who've already been successful with the hope that out of the encouragement and the exposure, there's so many things that so many people don't even know about. They don't know how the city accomplishes this or that or how they get these things that they want. I take them because the other principle that I try to remember is, and the very reason that each of us is here tonight is because we have asked ourselves the question and answered it, if not me, then who? Wow, let me say that. Kimberly, I didn't miss you, did I? No, I went first. Okay, let me, let me say this. This has been a joy. I want to express my extreme appreciation and respect for those of you all that have put yourself forth uh, in this arena. I know what's involved in this arena, and I know the sacrifices that all of you have made. And I want to thank you for those sacrifices and being willing to serve. I heard that in everybody's comments during this particular piece. I also want to thank the viewing audience for viewing uh, all of us here in this panel of the African American Initiative. And I want you to join me in my appreciation of Robert Black, Mayor of the City of Richmond, Richmond, Kentucky, Paula McQuaney, Councilwoman, Louisville Metro Council, District 7, Louisville, Angela Evans, Fayette County Attorney, Kimberly Baird, Fayette County Commonwealth Attorney, Lexton, and uh, my good friend, James Atkins, Mayor-elect, City of Danville, Danville, Kentucky, and all the others that are out there that are doing great work, that are committed and sacrificed and will sacrifice going into the future. I trust that the information has been provided here is going to be beneficial to all. So I want to thank everyone that's taken part. I want to thank everyone uh, that's been in terms of the technical staff, Alan Benson, the AAI facilitator, Ron Jones, communications facilitator, Brunhilda Williams Carrington, a tech facilitator, as well as Langston Gaither, also a tech uh, facilitator. Thank you, everyone, from the African American Initiative in Kentucky, Senator Gerald Neal. Good night. As I always say, do the right thing. God bless you all. Thank you, Senator Neal. Thank you so much. Thank yeah. you. Well, he left us up. Enjoyed meeting you, ladies. <laughs>